Welcome back to this edition of The Kilted Therapist, talking to you about the subconscious mind. If you recall from the first episode, we talked a lot about um, kind of what is the subconscious mind? Where does it come from? What does it do? What is its function? <clears throat> and as you recall, I've been talking to you from a book uh, that was written in the 1920s, but it's still very appropriate today. And so what I wanted to do was talk to you just briefly about a couple of things that are happening in the space of the subconscious mind. Now I'm looking at a paper. Uh, I'm going to read you just a, a snippet of this. It's called The Potentials of Subconscious Mind. Uh, this is Priya Shreya Suraka, uh, Dr. Uh, Divya Yain. Um, article info is, this is volume number 8, issue number 1, pages 44 to 52. It was published January, February of 2021. And this is in the International Journal of Scientific Research in Science, Engineering, and Technology. Let me read the abstract real quick. This paper addresses the subconscious mind and its fascinating effects on a human's life without their realization. The subconscious and its phenomenon can be considered a significant source of un to understand the secrets to the power this mankind beholds. People think they know what they are doing, who they are, not even realizing how they're directed by the greatest power of all, the subconscious mind, whose powers in disguise are yet to be discovered. This paper tells the incompatible nature of human subconscious mind. It has always been a topic of great discussions and arguments. This paper considers all the research papers and patterns of information throughout the history and modern period. Hence, it concludes the importance of the subconscious mind and how one can learn utilizing it at its best. Now understand, they're going to be talking about dreams, um, hypothesis, beliefs, and control, and the thought process. So I want to start with just a quick story. As a clinical therapist, I talk with people and hear a, a broad range of stories. The interesting thing is uh, I'm participating in a class called the Unifying Theory. Um, and in this class, much is made of the fact that we, um, as therapists, try to enter the client's holodeck. How do they make meaning? How do they decide what an event uh, it should be interpreted through what filters and how um, to construct that in the subconscious mind in order to be able to use whatever that event is. Now, mind you, I told you that uh, for a little over 25 years, I was a, a street cop, uh, both in Battle Creek, Michigan and Rapid City, South Dakota. Now, here's the thing to bear in mind. I also talked to you about the fact that I had done some stress inoculation. And you might be thinking, okay, Kelly, um, how did you do that? How successful was that? That's an anecdotal personal experience. But in my case, I didn't have the leftover triggers. Uh, I certainly didn't have problems. And I, I continue to not have problems. Um, here I am uh, seven years post uh, leaving the job. I don't have nightmares. I don't uh, get startled. I don't have any of the typical aspects of trauma that are associated with uh, some of the significant events that I was in. And I was a pretty assertive. In fact, if um, any of you who knew me when I was copping uh, recall the kind of cop that I was, I if I was um, anywhere close to something that was popping off, I was there. Uh, and a few times I got pulled out of the car by people um, <laughs> who didn't want to see me get hurt, which was probably really good. So to say that the unconscious mind or the subconscious is a storehouse, begins to give us an image, um, and the, the thought image that comes to my mind uh, is Warehouse 13. There's a little bit of everything in our, our storehouse and if we think about the subconscious in that aspect, you may recall if you've ever seen the uh, TV series, uh, I think it was from um, the early 2000s. <clears throat> in that warehouse was magic, but it was also objects. And when you think about the relationship that we have with objects and the meaning that we give them, I want you to bear that in mind as we continue our journey through uh, the book called Applied Psychology and the chapter on uh, subconsciousness. Also with regard to this paper, so it says here a common, uh, let me start over again. What it says in the introduction is, it is common to hear about conscious and subconscious actions taken in life. 
one's behavior and actions are less rational than believed to be. The human ability to control thoughts, movements, or feel emotions depends on the depth of the information processing that is, quote, brain, and quote, more precisely, the subconscious self. The human brain can be divided into three levels. Conscious elucidates all thoughts and actions within awareness. Subconscious defines all reactions and automatic responses that are overlooked unless thought about or analyzed. Unconscious expound past events and memories. It is believed that one consciously controls all of its actions, which prevents their understanding of who they are, how to make decisions, and many other things followed. And while ignoring the existence of this almighty power, an individual can miss a lot. Understanding and using it exceptionally revamp our lives. A. Common effects of the subconscious mind in everyday life. And then here's a quote. If we look upon our mind as a garden and we plant seeds of thoughts in our subconscious mind all day long based on our habitual thinking, as we sow, we shall reap in our body and the environment. And then it goes on to say, end quote, this is how strong the subconscious is just by the thought process brain just by the thought process, brain can help do wonders, and that is why it is said nothing is impossible, especially when they are not aware of how to make it possible. And not just this, there are so many magnificent phenomena occurring due to the thought process. And then it goes on to talk about how to use the unconscious or subconscious self. Now I'm going to share another quick story with you. Uh, back in the mid-1990s, I was a police officer at Battle Creek Police Department. Uh, I was a D.A.R.E. officer at the time, and I did a lot of fundraising in order to promote the program. Whether you agree with the program or you don't isn't really the point of this story. The point of this story is that I participated in something called Cowboy Poker. Now, if you're not familiar with Cowboy Poker, this is a, a rodeo event where you put a card table for chairs, and you sit four people around that card table, and then you turn loose a 2,000-pound bull, the last person seated wins. So here's what is really important about what happened in my experience playing cowboy poker. I had never played cowboy poker before this event uh, and to my knowledge I don't think I'd ever been chased by a bull before. Now here's uh, Here's kind of the funny part of this. A coworker of mine was participating for a different charity. He was seated directly across from me. I was seated with my back to the gate where the bull was. I looked over my shoulder to kind of get an idea of um, the gate. And then I looked back at Chuck who was sitting across from me. The other two gentlemen that were seated at the table were younger. I heard the hasp on the uh, gate come away made a clanking noise, and then I could hear the crowd as the bull came flying at us. As a result of this, the table got upended because the bull went right for Chuck. <laughs> and as a result of all of Chuck's movement, the bull was attracted to the movement. It upended the table. The other two fellas got up, ran to the gates, um, to the sides of the corral where we were at, and I went over backwards in my chair. I rolled to my right side, and without realizing it, I threw the chair at the bull. The bull hooked my left elbow, which spun me, and then I found uh, my way to the edge of the arena and managed, uh, another cowboy pulled me up. I, I wasn't even aware that he was doing it. But here's the thing, I didn't consciously have time to make a plan about going over backwards. It certainly never crossed my mind that this was going to happen, and I had absolutely zero idea uh, that I was doing the things that I was doing. But this is the brilliant part of this because I'd been around horses for a while. I was on the mounted division. Um, I'd also spent enough time uh, growing up in farmland that I kind of understood how cows navigate. And as a result, my unconscious mind said, throw something to distract the bull, buy yourself some time. Again, I didn't have that as a conscious thought. That's just what my body did. Later on, I found out that I'd also been kicked in the back of my left calf. Now, the thing is on video, I'm trying to figure out how to get it converted from VHS. Um, I got to find somebody that can do that for me. Uh, I'll definitely share that with you, though, because it, it, it's hilarious. The whole thing takes less than two minutes. But here's the point. The subconscious mind 
had a library of experiences because I'd seen cowboy poker played before, so I kind of understood how it worked. And then I also kind of understood that bulls are attracted to movement. This is why bullfighting was so popular. Uh, it had less to do with the red cape and more to do with the movement of the cape. So think about it in those terms. And um, let me go on. So the, the subconscious self also sometimes provides insight. It holds on to our ideas. It holds on to a whole lot of things um, in terms of experience. But again, it's not perfect. It's not a video camera that is capturing every essence of every experience you've ever had. What it's doing is it's working in partnership with the reticular activation system and the autonomic nervous system. The reticular activation system, or RAS, is located midbrain. This uh, and the autom autonomic nervous system don't have language, so I couldn't even encode it or tell it what to do. But what this particular location in the brain does is it helps us to make decisions, but it does it based on intense emotional experiences, and then it attaches those experiences uh, with pictures, sights, sounds, and sensations, and then stores them in the memory. Now, some of this is a survival mechanism. Some of this, I think, is to remind us of where pleasure is in order to be able to seek that pleasure. So you need to know that. Now, I'm going to refer back to that paper for just a second because there's a point here that I, I just want to make mention of. Um, and I, I'll include the first page here uh, somewhere up above here so that you can see it. Um, it says there are many parts of the subconscious, like vivid dreams, deja vu, jamais vu, astral projection, and body possessions. This paper thoroughly reviews dream psychology and deja vu, ancient and modern time comparison in their studies, comparison of different research papers and beliefs of various writers, different types of theories and surveys done over time, how important their understanding is for the benefit of mankind. Now, uh, I got to tell you, prior to this project, I really didn't know what jamais vu was. Um, and I'll, I'll go on to explain that in just a minute. It's the, uh, the interesting thing, though, here about astral projections, spirit possessions, and so many other things. Um, that, what an intriguing statement. Because uh, here's the, the other thing that I can tell you from my experience as a therapist. When I was getting my training to be a therapist, there was a lot of talk about cultures around the world that embrace things like vivid dreaming um, or lucid dreaming, astral projection, spirit possessions. And there was a lot of talk about how uh, in some cultures, instead of going to see a therapist, uh, you would go see the chief shaman or whoever the religious person was of your tribe. That person would then help you to navigate the difficulties of whatever it is that you were experiencing, or if you had a curse placed on you, they would help you to eliminate that. Now think about that. Tuck that away in the back of your, your mind for just a few minutes. That's kind of an important statement in view of what I just read to you from this research paper. Now again, this research paper wasn't published in the United States by um, American academics. Because in our Western philosophy, we tend to look at that as not scientific and definitely something that can be explained away uh, in other means. But in other cultures, this is um, a very ancient premise that says all of these things are possible, they're very real, um, and that it is something that can be addressed cogently through rituals, rites, practices, what have you. It would be unfair for me to discount those experiences uh, given the fact that there is a significant body of research in those cultures about how that works. Now, the argument from Western uh, scientists is, well, you know, this is placebo or nocebo. And if you're not familiar with what placebo or nocebo is, these are um, the, the mind convincing itself that something is or isn't and then uh, behaving from that premise. <clears throat> Now let me go back to what jamais vu is, uh, unless you speak French. It's the opposite of déjà vu. Um, it, it means never seen. It, it, it's a state of not remembering something already experienced. So that's kind of an interesting phenomenon. 
uh, once upon a time I had this theory. I, I was a young patrol officer and I remember I was on my mountain bike and my partner that day said something about, oh, I just experienced deja vu. And I said, can I tell you my theory of that? <laughs> and my bike partner said, uh, you've got a theory about deja vu. And I said, yeah, I think it's fo um, time folding in on itself and you're making a different decision depending on what you do now. Um, I don't know that there's any premise to that other than it was just a theory that I had because uh, I was thinking about it for some reason. I don't know. I still don't know that I'm right or that I'm wrong. It was just something that occurred to me. But the thing about this article is that it talks about um, the assumption of the presence of a soul or consciousness called natural body. Well, why might that be important to any of these things? Well, again, if spirit is able to be possessed, or if the vessel is able to be possessed, then it stands to reason, then, that there's a strong belief that something is competing uh, for pride of place in the mind. Just my supposition. Again, I'm happy to, to hear your thoughts on that. So, now the rest of this paper goes on to talk about dream psychology. Um, interestingly enough, it talks about Egyptian history, uh, Greek history, Roman history, and then the two guys who started to explore this, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. And then they talked about uh, the different kinds of dreams, and they created categories for this. And incidentally, there are a number of researchers who are probing dreams. In fact, if you ever saw the movie Inception, uh, this is predicated on the idea that dreams can be manipulated by um, a conscious part of the mind. So it's kind of fascinating. And again, I'm going to link a copy of this article with this because it's really fascinating uh, to see how it looks at the structure of the brain, but also how these things work. Now let me go back to deja vu for just a moment. I'm going to read from the paper for a second. It says, deja vu is a notion of experiencing the same event already before. People don't get any weird feeling of having experienced things that it feels overwhelmed by a distinct sense of expectancy. Teenagers have this untrammeled power of observation, which makes them a lot more uh, into such things as deja vu, as they're a better ob observer. Now, I, I'm going to point out something important about that. And this is something that I've seen with my clients. A lot of the time, my clients have gotten very skilled at avoiding emotion and avoiding memory. Um, principally because if we're trying to avoid something that's painful or difficult, uh, we'll, we'll move heaven and earth to not have to go back through that again. And consequently, that also means then that we begin to shut down parts of our emotional response and regulation system. So now let me continue. It says there are portions of the brain working for the past, present, and the future. The temporal lobes are associated with the past, whereas the frontal lobe is associated with the future and the underlying intermediate portions, the limbic system. Each instance of the self demonstrates a new emotional response, but only if circumstances have changed in every 25 milliseconds. The duration of the present in neurological terms is so brief that one cannot experience it so much as remember it. Deja vu also frequently leads up to temporal lobe epilepsy attacks. Keep that in the back of your mind as well. And then it goes on to talk about the different types of deja vu experiences. And there's, there's a whole table here that summarizes that. And their conclusion after surveys suggests that people having deja vu were mostly travelers or watched movies more often, which means they have more potential memory. 80 years old theory uh, says, the idea that deja vu might be driven by unrecalled memory from a situation same as the previous one. It might be compared to the tip of the tongue experience, an experience which makes people knowing some word but still not being able to recall it. It can also occur because that event might have already occurred. Another prediction study, deja vu was more likely in configurable similar scenes. Deja vu biased people that they have notions about future occurring situations even when they don't. The graph um, shows the number of people having deja vu had been through that same situation, but the reasons can also be that they've been in a familiar situation in their dreams or a movie. So I thought that was pretty salient. Their conclusion about this is that um, there's a lot more to be researched. Which, you know, I, I agree. Um, I think it's interesting, however, and I told you, you know, we'll come back to this. The interesting thing about this, 
at least for me, and maybe for you as well, is that when we think about deja vu, if we're not aware uh, that the brain is having difficulty separating something that is new from something that we've experienced that was somewhat familiar before, that's interesting. But it goes back to that bias that the brain has and the way that it works in order to shield us. Now, sometimes we'll even deny the deja vu or we'll deny that we've had the previous experience. Um, I, I've met people that do that as well. So, um, let's see. Going back to page 49 of my applied psychology book, it says, on the other hand, it must be borne in mind that there are limits to the extension of this concept, talking about um, the subconscious um, as a theoretically susceptible um, part of the brain. And let me go back and just refresh you. Uh, what they're saying here is that sometimes when we're encoding memories, we're doing it very poorly. Now, I'm, I'm borrowing a lot from modern day uh, studies, neurological studies about the brain. <clears throat> Typically, when we're encoding memory, we're filtering it through the lens of experience, but we're also trying to decide how to interpret it. And again, it's not put together in a way that is linear, logical, or that follows a strict uh, piece of film. And this is the hard part for my clients to wrap their head around because they, they'll tell me things like, yeah, but I remember. Yes, take a look at the word, R-E. What is re? You're, you're doing something over again. And the member part is to assemble or um, a piece. So what's happening is the brain is trying to constantly reassemble something and make it make sense because over time, parts of it degrade and are pruned off. And this is a neurological um, observation that has been made by several neural researchers. So then it goes on to say, um, and I, again, I'm reading, complicated performances of reasoning and self-directive activity are frequent among the facts to be explained. Performances which under ordinary conditions we should understand to be the work of consciousness, but which is occurring do not seem to be conscious in the usual meaning of that term. Sleepwalking and hypnotic behavior may serve as illustrations. So when I do hypnosis, a couple of things that I'm noticing in people because I tell everyone, uh, you can be fully aware of everything that is happening during the hypnosis. A phenomenon that occurs, though, is a lot of people fall asleep during hypnosis because you get so relaxed. So you miss things because your conscious mind isn't paying attention anymore. And if you go back to that diagram that I showed you before about the brain state, um, sometimes things are just not happening in the conscious realm where the conscious mind is giving attention to that and focused on that. So just be aware of that. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit down here because it talks about marginal subconscious. Many of the facts in question are understood as belonging to the margin or fringe of the field of consciousness. We are at all times faintly aware of much beside the object which occupies the focus of our attention. Sensory stimuli of various kinds, external and internal, are perceived in this way, sometimes with the effect of turning attention to them, sometimes without any noticeable diversion of the focal process. Passing shadows, sound of distant voices, the flavor of food, the slight pain of a strained muscle are illustrative cases. Our constant feeling of bodily selfhood is apparently of this sort of vague sensory content produced by the occurrence of innumerable physiological processes. Now, if I go back to my story, though, about getting hooked in the elbow and getting kicked, those are all outside of my conscious awareness. Because my only goal, my only focus was to get to safety when that bull was coming at me. Um, and, you know, this is true across a lot of experiences. Think about your own experience with maybe a car crash or getting into a fist fight or some other catastrophe. Notice how your focus becomes exceptionally narrow. Now, here's the uh, thing going back to tactical edge that I talked about in the first video. The way that we avoid going into the fight or flight, and or at least to manage it, because you're still going to get the adrenaline dump because the body recognizes I'm under threat. Something really bad's about to happen or could. So what we try to do to a stress inoculate, and this is a good rule of thumb when you are dealing with difficult emotions. And so this, this is a, a therapy moment for educational purposes. 
Often what I tell clients to do is to put themselves back into that state of feeling that. Notice where they feel what they feel in their body, but observe it. Because you cannot relive that event. What you do is you re-experience the memory of that event. And then your body has a sensation that is attached to that. And it floods the system that says, oh, I remember this. And then it puts you back into that experience, but it's not quite the same as it was when it first happened. So that's an important therapeutic point to pay attention to because uh, what we understand uh, is that, no, 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 I, I, I feel it. Well, maybe not, maybe not. And now hear me out before you blow me up in the comments. The thing that you're feeling is a sensation as a result of having touched a memory in the past, but it's not the same pain because your body, depending on how much you go back into the past and revisit those memories, is creating new pain. Because it says every time you go there, you feel something. And we begin to recognize and create a narrative around that. As a result of that, we then increase the amount of pain, so to speak, turning the volume up on the pain. And this is what I invite my clients to, is I, I let them know, um, turn the volume down on the pain. Just observe what you can see, see what you saw, hear what you heard, feel what you felt, know what you knew at the time that this was going on, but see it as though you're looking at a movie. Yes, I know what I told you, but when you do this, what you do then is you control it. And so now it becomes manageable. And this is what is brilliant about the conscious mind, especially when we tap into imagination, because that's what we're employing when we're trying to resolve past trauma. And if we do it appropriately and we do it slowly and correctly, then now that's a memory, but it doesn't have all of the other tangential stuff associated with it that makes it so difficult to, to sit with it or to examine it. Um, and I, I tell them, you know, become a forensic examiner. We're going to look at this through the lens of this happened to somebody else. What do you notice? What do you see? Um, what do you understand about this? How do you interpret this? And it allows us then in micro doses to be able to explore this for meaning and then recognize, do I, do I want to continue to have those experiences? So that's the brilliance of how we use the subconscious mind as a driver. then in micro doses to be able to explore this for meaning and then recognize do I do I want to hear what you heard feel what you felt know what you knew at the time that this was going on but see it as though you're looking at a movie yes I know what I told you but when you do this what you do then is you control it and so now it becomes manageable and this is what is brilliant about the conscious mind, especially when we tap into imagination, because that's what we're employing when we're trying to resolve past trauma. And if we do it appropriately and we do it slowly and correctly, then now that's a memory, but it doesn't have all of the other tangential stuff associated with it that makes it so difficult to, to sit with it or to examine it. Um, and I, I tell them, you know, become a forensic examiner. We're going to look at this through the lens of this happened to somebody else. What do you notice? What do you see? Um, what do you understand about this? How do you interpret this? And it allows us then in micro doses to be able to explore this for meaning and then recognize, do I, do I want to continue to have those experiences? So that's the brilliance of how we use the subconscious mind as a driver.
All right, so now I'm going to talk to you about another paper that was written. Um, this is in Springer. Um, and I'm looking for the name of the uh, journal. It's called Literature. Um, and the title of this paper is uh, Overcomplicated Technology at the Limits of Comprehension. This is uh, from a book. Uh, Arbison, Arbisman uh, published this in 2016. Um, and it says how to form and shape an organization and its subconscious mind. Now, bear with. Um, what this abstract says is that this is a theory of complex systems based on systems theory and chaos theory and the findings um, concerning the, the emergence. Um, and then what it does is it goes on to talk about uh, the perception, cognition, and knowledge in the processes of decision making and interaction. And then looking at how do we use that um, as a framework. Now, truth be told, what this article really is, is it it's how do we deal with that subculture that's um, in uh, somewhat pervasive in, in nearly every organization and every relationship. And then what it's doing is it's looking at what's in the driver's seat uh, of these organizations and what is driving the, the, the system. Now, I know what you're thinking. Um, that sounded like word salad, Kelly. I know it did. Systems thinking is this. Everything is contingent upon something else and there is a link and it's causal. Sometimes what happens is every business, um, every relationship uh, is predicated on all of the other relationships that the person at the center uh, has experienced and continues to experience uh, in the now. But if we look at what the subconscious does in its driving of that decision-making process, we begin to recognize that there's a, a wellspring of ideas that are located in our subconscious as a means of giving us uh, impetus to go forward and build something new. So I, I, I just wanted to share that. This is a good article. Um, it doesn't have as much to do with the subconscious mind of an individual as much as how this relates to AI. But again, it's a, a good article. Now, I'm not going to go into parapsychology in this episode um, because that's a whole other ball of wax. I don't have any expertise in that. And tangentially, um, I think, you know, there's probably something there to be discussed and uncovered when it comes to what happens in the subconscious. But again, uh, that's way outside my competency. So I'm going back to um, the book on page 51. It says, under certain conditions, the whole system splits into separate parts, so to speak, which function more or less independently. In such cases, the victim cannot recall past experiences or act in his usual way. He may fail to recognize the family and friends, lose lifelong habits, and display new emotional and active traits. Yet the loss is not absolute or indeed real. The dissociated system of ideas, feelings, and impulses continues to exist, perhaps dormant for weeks or months, perhaps occasionally returning in normal expression of the personality. And what they're talking about here is when there is um, something that has happened to the cortical, uh, major and minor cortical areas of the brain. So I'm, I'm going to talk a, a minute about what dissociated subconscious is. This is a really at the heart of why this is so important for you to understand. We dissociate um, actually fairly regularly. It's just we don't think of it that way. If we're overwhelmed, overtaxed, or for some reason something um, is plaguing us in terms of anxious thought and moods, intrusive thoughts, we begin to move away from our everyday function and we go into the habit and the subconscious begins to work uh, in the background taking us through the repetitive activities of our day. 
That's important to know. Now, going on here, it says um, dissociation shows various forms and degrees of thoroughness ranging all the way from little slips of memory, inconsistent ideas, and absent-minded actions to the appearance of distinct personalities, each with its own name, habits, and characteristics. Um, this was written before they called it dissociative identity disorder, or um, if you remember in the 70s, Sybil and the multiple personality disorders. What he's talking about is the subconscious works really hard to protect the higher brain and the, the identity of self. And in this, what it's also doing is sometimes compartmentalizing aspects of the personality in order to protect that person. This is a, a widely studied um, and it's a very fascinating uh, part of human psychology. Uh, I recall uh, at university watching a video of a woman, uh, would have been eight years ago, telling her story about DID and she had been studied by at least a half dozen psychiatrists who verified she is actually DID. And the fascinating part of this is there's a dominant protector and then there's a child in there. Now, in the course of my career, only one time have I encountered somebody who displayed some of those behaviors. I can't say for certain that this person was actually DID, but I could tell that there was a definitive change in the way the body looked, um, in the mannerisms, the, the tone of voice, even the sound of the voice, um, very different. Uh, again, I don't know for certain that this person was DID. I know that this person talked about um, three significant childhood traumas. Uh, this was a homeless person that I worked with in San Diego. And the fascinating part of my interview with this person was that he had a protector identity. Um, in fact, the guy that came in presented very gruff, uh, claimed to be in a street gang, talked a lot about violence and how much he hated cops, which was fun for me. Um, actually it was, because huh? he, he never pegged me. So I love that. So as you may have noticed, uh, there have been a couple of hiccups uh, in this recording. My apologies. I'm not sure how to edit those out. I'm still learning the software, so I apologize again. Um, I hope that you're finding this as fascinating as I did. Stay tuned for part three, which should be up on YouTube. If you do like this, like, share, subscribe, and please send me comments. Again, I'm at dragonslayersanon at gmail.com. Oh, by the way, I'm also on Patreon. Thanks. Bye. So as you may have noticed, uh, there have been a couple of hiccups uh, in this recording. My apologies. I'm not sure how to edit those out. I'm still learning the software, so I apologize again. Um, I hope that you're finding this as fascinating as I did. Stay tuned for part three, which should be up on YouTube. If you do like this, like, share, subscribe, and please send me comments. Again, I'm at dragonslayersanon at gmail.com. Oh, by the way, I'm also on Patreon. Thanks. Bye. So as you may have noticed, uh, there have been a couple of hiccups uh, in this recording. My apologies. I'm not sure how to edit those out. I'm still learning the software, so I apologize again. Um, I hope that you're finding this as fascinating as I did. Stay tuned for part three, which should be up on YouTube. If you do like this, like, share, subscribe, and please send me comments. Again, I'm at dragonslayersanon at gmail.com. Oh, by the way, I'm also on Patreon. Thanks. Bye.